So, we started with uh, defining Gaussian mixture models which are just uh, superposition of uh, k different Gaussians and in a general mixture model instead of a Gaussian you can use any other uh, probability distribution. So, the three important uh, set of parameters are the mixture weights, uh, the mean and the covariance matrices of each of the Gaussians and there are k components, I have still not come back to uh, someone had asked how do we estimate k, we will see that today. Um, we saw some examples of how to fit Gaussian mixture models, uh, we saw that Gaussian mixture models are good models when uh, there is nat naturally good models when there is a clustered structure in the data. So, that each of those clusters uh, can be nicely fitted with a, with a Gaussian and uh, uh, then we saw that uh, the Gauss a Gaussian mixture model can be uh, very intuitively explained through the generative uh, uh, procedure where you assume that there is a latent variable that basically tells you which Gaussian to pick and then once you pick that you sample your or you generate your data from that particular Gaussian. I think this is very important to remember as uh, it makes a lot of the math, uh, uh, it makes sense of a lot of the math. Then we saw our uh, posterior probabilities the, which are also called responsibilities. The posterior probability of the latent variable taking a value k given the data and we saw it coming, coming up repeatedly in all our calculations. Uh, so, the estimation assuming that we know k on p dimensional data, the estimation problem is to estimate these pi k's uh, mu k and sigma k for each of the Gaussians right. And we saw that initially, we first saw that if we assume the, if we assume the, we know the responsibilities, then the math works out very nicely and we get very intuitive, uh, uh, intuitive forms for the different uh, parameters. <coughs> right. And then we uh, designed an iterative algorithm that essentially guesses the parameter first and computes these responsibilities and then refines the guess in each iteration. And later uh, we saw that this actually is the EM algorithm for Gaussian mixture models. So, let us see this more carefully. In general, EM had been uh, proposed for data which had some hidden uh, data points not known when you get the data set uh, and uh, so, Z is uh, by Z, uh, we denote that hidden data by Z and for the purpose of this discussion we assumed it is discrete so, and later we saw that in the case of Gaussian mixture models, uh, we can take the latent variables to be hidden that is a common trick used in many other models. <clears throat> and then we saw that EM is a good approach to take when uh, the joint likelihood, the complete data likelihood can be easily parameterized and the if, if that is a, uh, if we make that assumption, then we see that uh, we can get the marginal likelihood also, right. So, uh, what is EM? The key idea is that, so this, this is the key idea. We take the expectation of the log likelihood of the complete data under the distribution of the latent variables assuming the guesses of the parameters that we have made, right. And instead of computing the maximum likelihood, we compute the parameters th that maximizes this expectation. And this is the key idea of EM, right. Actually, if you remember this, uh, yeah, I mean, this, this should be the main takeaway of this class, this formula. <laughs> so, then we saw that if we, uh, if we use this uh, formulation, then uh, for Gaussian mixture models, we essentially get back the iterative algorithm that we had guessed we uh, use this, so this, this expectation is also called Q function in the literature. We get a very nice form for the Q function. Uh, the reason 
So the reason we get a nice form is uh, one because we are using an expectation operator which pushes the summation to the outside and the second reason is that we get so we get the logarithm of we get this logarithm of the Gaussian without any summation inside the expectation pushes it outside right that was the reason why the math worked out and the der derivatives became very easy to calculate for the case of Gaussian right. we essentially got back the same formulas for uh, mu k sigma k and pi k that we had uh, guessed earlier assuming that we know the responsibilities right so the general em algorithm is this guess the posterior distribution of the hidden data or the latent variables and and then refine your guess by taking by maximizing the q function which is the expectation of the complete data likelihood under the distribution of z with your current guess and today we are going to see that uh, this procedure is 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 nice because it uh, it guarantees that the likelihood will increase in every iteration so whatever likelihood you start with at every iteration the likelihood is going to increase so that's what we are going to show today so this is the complete em algorithm for estimating the parameters of a gaussian mixture and we also saw that if we take uh, if we assume that the only parameter to be determined is mu k which means all, all we assume that all the gaussians are uh, spherical uh, with known uh, uh, with known uh, covariance matrices and pi k is set to 1 over k then essentially what we get back is the k means algorithm So we, we can see this, so this is the theoretical guarantee I was talking about, EM monotonically increases the observed data likelihood and uh, until it reaches some local maximum. It can also get stuck in some saddle point, but uh, it is, yeah, so it does not give you the global maximum, it only gives you, a, it only reaches, takes you to the local maximum. So let me show you that simulation that I had shown you last time. So I generate some data, okay. three Gaussians, this is what the data looks like, it was generated like this by taking those three means and uh, uh, covariance matrices, this is what the fitted density looks like, right. if I run EM once. Right. So this time EM did not do well. You can see what happened. The means that it inferred were two of them are here and the third one is here. Because these two clusters are very close together, it assumed that it is coming, it is being generated from the same Gaussian. Right. Let us now run this. So I ran this 10 times. And what I see is that the likelihood for each of this run, the likelihood keeps increasing. Right? Every time for each iteration, the likelihood increases. Sometimes it gets stuck and uh, at a saddle point or a fixed point and, and, and then does not increase. Right? So this is the typical behavior of EM. In fact, this is a very good debugging tool if you are if you're, uh, uh, writing EM algorithms for your models. And if you see that the likelihood is not increasing, there is some bug in your program. Now let us see in these 10 runs, these are the likelihood values it got stuck at at the end or it stopped at at the end, not necessarily stuck at. So if we see the minimum of these, this is the second one and we see the fitted density when we use that run, yeah, we see the fit is not very good, if you take the maximum, the maximum likelihood among those 10 runs, it is the ninth one, right. 
the fit is much better now. You see, this time when the likelihood was in the ninth run, the likelihood was the highest among these 10 runs and the fit was also much better. So, now let us prove that what we saw there is true in all cases, that it actually monotonically increases the likelihood in every iteration. So, the main, res the main result we will need to prove this is Jensen's inequality. Are you all familiar with this? No? Okay. It is very simple. So, if you have a convex function, then uh, and you have uh, a linear combination of these points x i, then the convex function applied to the linear combination is less than or equal to the uh, summation, the linear combination of the uh, of f x i, where the function is applied to each of the x i's. Right? And uh, what we are interested in, you might have guessed, is the logarithm function, because log is what appears in our summation. And if we use the fact that minus log x is convex and put it here, then we get this inequality, right? it is the same thing. The function is just the logarithm. So, what we see is that uh, log of a summation uh, is always greater than or equal to the summation of those uh, lambda i times log x i. Right? So, let us start with, uh, so we have we have these latent variables or the hidden variables in some cases. Let us assume that they, they let us assume that q is some arbitrary distribution over the latent variables. We are, we will not define what q is right now. Okay. So, because these are probability values, uh, each of these q z n s for each uh, latent variable is greater than 0 and the sum over all z n is equal to 1. Right. So, now let us take the likelihood of our data and we express it again as usual in terms of the joint likelihood with respect to the latent variables. And then we just multiply and divide by q of z n. Right? And now, because of this condition, q of z n is the same as lambda i is here. It follows the uh, assumptions of Jensen's inequality. Right? So, we can apply Jensen's inequality here and get a lower bound on this expression. Right? So, basically take the summation outside and get the log inside and uh, this lower bound just follows from Jensen's inequality. Right? All we have done is applied this inequality <coughs> and lambda i's are the q z n's here because their probabilities the assumptions uh, uh, are true. Okay? So, now this logarithm can be written as a difference. Uh, of the numerator log of the numerator minus log of the denominator. And what we get here, now this expression should start looking familiar to you. This is just an expectation, is expectation of the complete data likelihood under the distribution q. Right? So, this is something that we, we have been working with uh, in E m. And on this side, we have the entropy. Right? This so, this entropy term is not going to be not going to play a, play a big role here, but we are going to be interested in this. So, let us call this q. This is a diff, although it will be the same q eventually, I have uh, used a different q here because right now we do not know that it is the same q. Okay. So, what have we got? We have got a lower bound on the log likelihood, right. and we have proved this for any arbitrary distribution. Right. We have not said that it is the distribution of the latent variables under the uh, guesses uh, of the parameters that we had. We did not say anything about that. So, now the question is which distribution q should we choose? Any guesses? So, what we have is a lower bound. What kind of distribution would you like to choose? No guesses? Think iteratively. <laughs> All right. 
So we want, since this is a lower bound, we want the bound to be as tight as possible. Okay. So we will choose a Q such that we want to maximize, such that we maximize the lower bound to reach the actual likelihood. Right? That's a natural choice when you're leasing, when you're uh, dealing with bounds. Right? So let's see how we can choose such a such a Q. Okay. To do that, let's just look at this expression again. We will uh, ignore the uh, <coughs> summation n because. Uh, we will we'll bring it back later, but I have just not written it. So this is the original expression for the lower bound. Right? The Q function is here, I have just written that again here. And now we, I am just expressing this joint likelihood, I am factorizing it in this way. Right? So you have the probability of Xn, Zn, the joint probability is just the probability of uh, uh, Zn and then the probability of Zn given theta. So there should, there should be an Xn, Zn here. Uh, right. Yeah, it's fine. No, no, it's fine. Yeah, it's fine. Uh, right, so this is just a factorization of this probability. And then I, I just uh, separate it out in a different way this time. And what we get here is, is a term which is just the Kullback Leibler distance between Qzn and uh, this probability, this distribution. Right? It's the negative of the KL divergence between Qzn and probability of Zn given Xn and theta. Right? And this term is essentially uh, summing over all Zn for this. So this is independent of Q, and we just get logarithm of, uh, we just get the uh, likelihood back here. And here we have the negative KL divergence between these two distributions. So if we want the lower bound to reach the actual likelihood, which we are getting here, we want this term to become 0. Right? And that we can do by just putting Qzn equal to this probability, probability of Zn given Xn theta. Right? But again, we come back to the same problem that we do not know the actual theta, the curly theta. But in an iteration of Em, we have guessed the value of theta, theta m. So we can use that value of uh, theta m to, and, and use that probability distribution as Q. Okay. So what we get if we use this value for Qm, which is the probability of Zn uh, given Xn and the guessed <coughs> theta m values, is nothing but this, this expectation which we saw coming up here, except that instead of Q, we are using the, we are using Qm, which is based on the current guess value. And we are getting the entropy term, but this entropy term is independent of the thetas. So when we maximize this in our m step of Em, this does not play any role. And what we are eventually maximizing is this expectation of uh, the likelihood under the distribution of Z. So let me again summarize what I did. I took the log likelihood. This is the likelihood that we are interested in for getting maximum likelihood estimates. Using Jensen's inequality, I got a lower bound. The lower bound was in the form of an expectation, right? which is the expectation we, uh, we maximize in the E step if we take Qm to be exactly this probability distribution. And this probability distribution turns out to be exactly the probability distribution to take, which will maximize the lower bound to reach the actual data log likelihood at that step. Right? <coughs> so what? What have we done? We have maximized, we have taken, we have taken our current guesses and chosen a value of Qm uh, that will reach that will reach the actual likelihood with respect to the current guess. Right? But that has not brought us closer to the real theta, right? We are still working with our guesses of uh, the parameters. Is that, is that clear? 
So here comes the crucial part. Right? So at the nth step, we took QM the distribution of Zn to be exactly this probability distribution, the posterior distribution of Zn given uh, the data points and the current cases. And we saw that this uh, likelihood is exactly equal to the KL divergence plus the log likelihood. And because this KL divergence becomes 0 at this point, this Q function is exactly equal to the log likelihood which means the lower bound is tight after E step, which is what we wanted. And so maximizing Q after this is going to maximize the data log likelihood also. To see that, see this picture. So this is your current value, the guest value of theta. Now the E step and, and this red, red curve here is the actual data log likelihood with the original parameters that you do not know. Now what the, what the E step has ensured is that you get a lower bound using the Q function that we had. So that lower bound is L. So this is the, this is the lower bound, right? And which is exactly the expectation that we are trying to maximize. So you, you use this L function and you get a and you know that this is this this is a lower bound which means it is always lesser than the red curve right the important point is that at the e step this bound is tight which means this is touching the red curve right and if you maximize this you will get a new set of parameters which will increase the l value right but because this is touching it and because it is a lower bound, it will also increase the likelihood value for the with respect to the original theta. Right? So it is a trick because you, you cannot, we cannot compute this likelihood, but we know the lower bound, we have computed the lower bound and we are maximizing this, but it is guaranteed to be, the, the new values are guaranteed to increase the likelihood. In, <coughs> the original likelihood also because at this point the approximation is tight and we are maximizing it. So now again the, at the next step, the E step will ensure that the lower bound that you calculate, the green curve will be tight. And once again you maximize it, you will get a value somewhere here or yeah, anywhere here. And, uh, and then the next value of theta is again going to increase the likelihood because every time you are at each step, the E step will ensure that uh, you, you get a proper lower bound and you always get to the, uh, you always make sure that it is tight because of the choice of the distribution of Q that we take at each step. Why would it get stuck in a local optimal then? It looks optimal here. Sorry? Why would the expectation will reach only up to a local? Uh, yeah, because it, what if we get at a saddle point? The likelihood uh, curve need not always be like this, right? <coughs> right. So, for example, the likelihood likelihood value can be something like this. So, why wouldn't that curve reach there then? But you can suppose suppose it goes like this. Then how, how it's at this point it is not guaranteed to go up that way. It will just be here in this region. So the usual problem with uh, okay. optimization. So we can say now we can do this formally. We at the m plus one, m plus first round, we have some parameters. That's the log likelihood of those parameters, and we know that the Q function is a lower bound. We proved it for any any Q, any choice of the distribution, the small Q, and then. Uh, this Q value was chosen by the previous iterations M step. So this equality follows. This is the maximum value of Q which maximizes the uh, maximum of all parameters uh, curly theta. And then this by definition is greater than any Q here. And because this E step bound is tight, we get that this is equal to the logarithm, uh, equal to the likelihood in the previous step which is just the likelihood of the uh, previous step. Uh, 
Okay. So, any questions? No. Is this clear? Why it's increasing the likelihood at each point, at each iteration? All right. So now, uh, so that covers the basics of EM. Now let's look at uh, some strange cases. Uh, sometimes what happens is when you're running EM, you uh, you tend to get very strange solutions, and this could be one of the reasons. So I'm going to motivate this mathematically. So suppose you take your log likelihood for the uh, that you want to maximize and uh, you set now suppose you have two components okay uh, well it doesn't matter so, it, so take one of the components and set mu1 the mean to be equal to x1 one of the data points and uh, set sigma1 to be equal to uh, some diagonal matrix of uh, dimensionality p and take some pi1 so this can be just split into two parts we are looking at just one gaussian here and when you plug in these values you essentially get this expression right now what happens if uh, sigma 1 square the variance tends to zero this likelihood essentially tends to infinity i mean this total likelihood because this value goes to infinity right so this is a problem in general with maximum likelihood solutions. Uh, your, your, this, the, the, the likelihood will, will tend to infinity, although the fit is really bad. So the, in, this looks like, so the pictorial representation is something like this. What you are doing is you are taking two Gaussians and you are fitting just one data point on one, with one Gaussian and the other Gaussian is fitting the rest of the data points. Right? So this is in most real life cases this is not a good thing to do because uh, yeah it's very very unlikely that the data has been generated by two gaussians like this one data point from one gaussian and the rest from the other gaussian right so any so when when you try to do this with uh, just a single gaussian do you think you will get this problem why Yeah, but uh, suppose you have, suppose I give you like unidimensional case and I fit this one Gaussian here. This, it is, th there will be a non-zero probability of a point coming from somewhere here, right? Even if this is the mean. So intuitively we would think that the blue Gaussian is what might have generated this data with so much variance, right? But th there is a non-zero probability that the data has been generated from such a Gaussian. So why will we not have this problem there? It is not a local optimum. Yeah. So, the maximum likelihood solution will never give you this. The maximum likelihood solution is most likely to give you something like this, right? When you work out the likelihood, uh, the the likelihood for this the pink Gaussian is definitely going to be lesser than the likelihood for this. Right? And again, this is just due to the mathematical form of the Gaussian mixture. So, this because of the summation, this is really happening, because it's possible that you can fit the data like that in a way that the likelihood goes to infinity. So how do you deal with this? Uh, the simplest way in a frequentist framework is to just keep, when you are running EM, you check whether it is happening or not and if, you, if, if it is happening, then you just reinitialize the parameters. So you keep trying to detect, detect such collapsing components and try to do it. And in general, actually, it's better to restart EM several times because EM is uh, uh, so as you know, it it can get get stuck at a fixed point or a saddle point. 
So, with different initialization parameters, you can uh, get much better solutions as we saw in the simulation as well. Right. The Bayesian solution is to take priors, right. You take priors on each of the parameters and it turns out you can work out the math and see that the expectation, the E step remains the same and the only difference necessary is the uh, additional term in the M step that we need to maximize and this usually solves the problem by, by choosing right priors. So now, let us come to finding K. Till now, we have assumed that we know the number of components and uh, how do we find K? This is, there is no really good solution to finding K and uh, what statisticians usually prefer and what works well in practice is to generate many candidate models. You look at the data and you assume that, uh, okay, there cannot be lesser than 3 components here, there cannot be more than 12 components here. So, let us run EM for all these different comp values of K and you choose that K which uh, minimizes some criterion, okay. And this, there are different criteria that people have discussed. Uh, for example, it is something like the regularization that you do in other models, you basically penalize high values of K. So, the AIC Akai K information criterion is this, this is just the log likelihood plus uh, K. So, minimizing this will give you the, the least number of components which can explain the data well. Right? There is a Bayesian information criterion which uh, uses uh, K log N, similar uh, uh, general idea. And then there are other approaches for finding K which are uh, uh, Bayesian non-parametric approaches where uh, you assume some Dirichlet process priors and uh, then the, the, the method itself automatically uh, estimates K, right. right. So, the algorithm that we discussed in that form was given in 1977. So, you can imagine that a lot of work has been done on EM since 1977. There are a lot of different kinds of uh, EM algorithms. There are online versions that work on large streaming data sets. Uh, like I said, uh, EM is uh, designed to find local maximum. So, there are annealed versions that increases the chances of finding global maxima. Uh, the simplest solution is random restarts, but uh, annealing does something more. Uh, variation. So, sometimes, so in the case of Gaussian, we saw that the E step and the M steps they were computationally tractable. We could derive analytical formulas for these. But in a lot of cases, uh, if there is time, I can show you one. <coughs> we will see that they are not computationally tractable and sometimes you need to do additional things. So, there are variational versions of EM, there are stochastic versions of EM, Monte Carlo versions where you have intractable E steps. There is something called generalized EM which was uh, one of the earliest algorithms where you have computationally intractable M steps. Then when we have sequential parameters, dependent parameters, then there are other versions of EM. And uh, in general, EM is quite slow, right. So, your uh, each step within EM, e e within the iteration is uh, uh, computationally not very expensive, but convergence is usually very slow. And it is especially slow when you have lots of missing data or lots of uh, latent variables to infer, right. So, there are there are many, uh, many approaches to deal with it. There are these Aitken acceleration techniques, over relaxed EM and, and so on. So, to summarize, uh, like what I said, uh, the, the major advantage of EM is that it monotonically increases the likelihood, it guarantees that if you take any distribution, uh, any mixture model uh, or anything, any likelihood computation where there are hidden uh, variables or latent variables and you apply EM and if you follow the formulas carefully, you will, you will guarantee that uh, the likelihood is increased except at fixed points. And it is usually numerically very stable compared to other uh, techniques like gradient descent, it is easily implemented. And the interesting thing is that many problems can be modeled as incomplete data problems. We saw that in the case of Gaussian mixture. There is no missing data in the beginning, but we assume the latent variables to be missing. 
the disadvantages as I mentioned is slow convergence and uh, there are no guarantees of finding global maximum and the steps may be analytically intractable. Yeah. So, the two standard references have very nice uh, explanation for EM and uh, there are very nice tutorials also available. Matrix cookbook you should be familiar with to get all your matrix derivatives. And uh, this is the standard reference if you want to go really deep into EM, McLachlan and Krishnan's uh, book on EM, the whole book is on EM algorithm. So, EM can always solve it, but it may not be able to solve well. That's the, if there are lots of missing data, then usually the, uh, it does not give good. Uh, Right. So, there is some, there is, there is a lot of work on, uh, so these estimates that you are getting, you may need to, uh, you may sometimes want to know how good those estimates are. Right. So, you want to uh, get the standard errors on those estimates. So, there is, uh, so in fact, that is one of the flaws of EM, it does not automatically give you that, but there are methods to deal with that. For example, uh, there are some bootstrap uh, methods that can give you estimates of the error that you, est error estimates for the estimated uh, uh, parameters. In that uh, finding k, you had k max and k min, right? How do you get those two parameters? Yeah, they are also guessed. <laughs> so, that is uh, that's something you have to guess based on uh, the data that you have. So, if you if you take the standard uh, R packages like m cluster or something like that, uh, they usually have uh, some default parameters 2 and 12 or something like that but then you can set them. So, when m cluster runs and gives you like, like what I showed you in the simulation, when it runs and tries to uh, find the parameters, it runs it for all those different values of k and takes the best one, best one with respect to the likelihood. Okay. So, it will be a good exercise I think uh, like if you take, if you take some different distribution, so take something like Bernoulli, some very simple distribution and work out the math, it will be quite uh, nice to see how it works out. And yeah, even the, the other thing that I did not work out here, this part is also quite simple to do. Yeah. Assume that there is a prior and see how it works out. But the general idea is clear, right? Okay, 